Thank you, Akil. Uh, so next we will have Michelle Tam speak, and she is the New York Times best-selling author of um, Nom Nom Paleo. Um, she has won the Saver Award for her food blog, and she has over three million visitors a month on her blog. Her cookbook called Nom Nom Paleo Food for Humans was nominated for a James Beard Foundation Award and named one of the best cookbooks of the year by Serious Eats, The Wall Street Journal, and America's Test Kitchen. Michelle is also the Webby Award-winning creator of the best-selling Nom Nom Paleo cooking app. Uh, she's an avid Instagrammer, occasional periscoper and podcaster, a busy mom, and a former night shift pharmacist at Stanford. So she went here also. Uh, she's a Bay Area native, and she got her bachelor's at um, Berkeley in nutrition and for food science, and she graduated from pharmacy school here. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Tam. Thank you. Well, hello. It is weird being on this side of the lecture, and I think I used to be in the very back. Actually, this is, it's really funny, because I was asking Kiel, I was like, oh, I don't really remember where Cole Hall is. Like, oh, I remember it's the big hall where we watch movies and take tests, and then I came here, and I was like, this is all really nice now. Um, <laughs> and I used to be, I think, in the very back corner in the aisle, so I could, like, run to the bathroom and not pay attention. Um, so my talk today is going to be very, very practical. Even though I say it's the art and science, I'm going to go very, I'm going to delve very briefly in the um, science. Um, because I think, to me, the most important thing, no matter how nutrient dense or how much you know about, um, you know, how good food is for you, if you don't cook it, then there's no point. And so, you know, I've devoted, I guess, my life now to making food, you know, delicious, healthy, and super easy. And I think the best way to do that is to harness the power of umami. And so, on the menu, um, I'm going to talk about really briefly who I am, the history and science, but not really too much of the science, why healthcare providers should care about umami, and it's personal and also for your patients. Um, and then once we're all on board about how important umami is, I'm going to delve into umami-rich foods so you know what to buy when you're at the store. And this whole concept of umami synergy and how um, when you combine different raw ingredients that have umami, it just exponentially increases the tastiness of food. And then if there's time, um, I'm happy to answer non-technical, non-scientific, <laughs> practical cooking questions. <laughs> um, so this is me. I am a former zombie drug dealer. That's what I used to call myself because um, I graduated from UCSF in 2000. I totally thought I was going to work um, for Big Pharma. That actually was a dream of mine. I'm not even joking. <laughs> Before that, when I was at Cal and I was a food science major, my dream was to work in the flavor industry. And look at me now. <laughs> I've like done this complete 180. Um, I'm a self-taught home cook. When people refer to me as a chef, that's totally inaccurate. Um, and my sister, who is a chef, will constantly remind me that I am not a chef. Um, but I am a very enthusiastic home cook. Um, and I love food, and I, that is my purpose in life. <laughs> I have a very adventurous palate, so I've basically tried anything and everything. Um, back in college, I would, if someone paid me a dollar, I would eat whatever they would concoct because, you know, I was an entrepreneur even back then. Or stupid. Um, but I'm also one picky mother. Um, and that means that I am very picky about how food tastes. And I'm also a mother. <laughs> So I know, you know, when I have picky children, you know, what that entails. So I think the key to delicious food really is umami. Are you guys, I, are you guys familiar with what umami is? Just a quick raise. Yeah. 
Oh, oh good, so there are some no's, that's perfect. Um, so it is a loan word from the Japanese meaning savory taste. In fact, the guy who discovered umami, um, Professor Kune Ikeda, made up this uh, word um, by putting together two Japanese words, um, and it does mean savory taste, and it's the fifth taste. So I think a lot of people are familiar with the four basic tastes. They're salty, sweet, bitter, and sour. And then the fifth one is umami. And it actually didn't officially get recognized as a taste until 1985, but it was discovered way back in 1908. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about why there was that long lag. Um, but basically, if something tastes super delicious and it doesn't fall into those four other categories, then that's what umami is, and it should be the guiding force in your kitchen arsenal. So another way to describe it is that it's a meaty taste, and what's different from other tastes like um, sweet or um, salty is that it actually lingers and it spreads across your tongue. So it's something very mouth-filling and it stays with you. Um, it also modulates other flavors, so it diminishes sour and bitter tastes, and it also accentuates salt. And so what's really funny is when I was doing research for this, um, all these papers are saying, well, it can really help, you know, um, you know, healthy eating because it can decrease on the fat. I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> and it can also decrease the salt. And for some people, you know, that is an issue, um, you know, if you have hypertension that is responsive to salt. So this is the father of umami. I highly doubt he said yo, but I thought it was kind of asking for that word bubble. Um, <laughs> But back in 1908, he was a professor in Tokyo, and I guess one day he came home from work and his wife presented him with this bowl of cucumber soup, but it tasted different from the cucumber soup that she had given him before. And he asked her, like, what, what makes this taste so delicious? It's like, oh, this time I actually cooked it with some kombu, which is this brown algae. And so he's like, I think this brown algae is the secret for this indescribable taste. And so he took, like, apparently tons and tons of um, kombu, and he took it to the lab. And after extraction and all sorts of other stuff that you know, chemists do, he isolated this salt and it turned out to be glutamate. And kombu actually is naturally supposed to have, I think, the highest amount of free glutamate in, in things found naturally. And he discovered that this, this one salt is the cause for umami. And what's actually a very interesting aside is he is the father of MSG, and I think along with um, isolating glutamate, he discovered how, and he patented a method where you could um, you could manufacture MSG from defatted soybeans and uh, wheat. And he co-founded a company called Ajinomoto, um, which is now the number one producer of MSG and aspartame, and all sorts of flavor chemicals and things that I wanted to make when I was a college student. <laughs> um, so. On the more scientific basis, the thing that actually causes umami and elicits umami are glutamate and ribonucleotides. And ribonucleotides are the building blocks of nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. Um, so basically, if your raw ingredient has glutamate, and if you also have a raw ingredient that has ribonucleotides, that is what makes you taste this, you know, delicious taste sensation. Um, but there is a lot, so glutamate is, um, you know, an amino acid, so it's a building block of, or the building block of proteins. But you really don't experience umami until the protein is broken down and the glutamic acid is actually converted to the salt. And it, it occurs naturally in savory foods, so you don't have to go and buy a bottle of MSG, which is what my mom <laughs> used to do, um, and you know, sprinkle it on your food. But more importantly, why should healthcare providers, I'm assuming many of you guys are healthcare providers or soon to be healthcare providers, why should you care about umami? And so I know this sounds kind of um, over the top, but some people have said that umami is essential for human survival because, um, you know, 
there's umami that's present in amniotic fluid. It's um, high in breast milk. And so there's um, a theory that we've been hardwired from the womb to recognize umami. And the reason why is um, umami represents protein, and it's a very essential nutrient for people. And so um, you've just been hardwired from the womb to recognize umami because this is something that will help you grow big and strong. And there are umami receptors on the tongue and in the stomach um, that help you, um, you know, get ready for protein foods, and it you know gets your pancreas all jazzed up. Um, and it also helps regulate appetite. And so it does this in several ways. Um, there was a study in Japan where they had um, a group of elderly um, individuals that were failing to thrive. And so they gave them all a cup of kelp tea, um, which is very high in umami. And they discovered that it stimulated their appetite. It increased their salivation. And because of that, um, they were hungrier. And when they actually ate food, because they had increased salivation, it made the food taste better, it broke down the food easier, they were able to chew it, and they, you know, they gained weight, they increased their appetite. So there's a lot of reasons why you should incorporate umami into uh, your foods and into your patients' foods. And so here is a picture of, um, they actually did this experiment. I don't know how it passed IRB, because these babies look really small. Um, but they, you know, they fed them different uh, taste sensations, and you can see that they don't really like the sour and the bitter, um, but the umami and the sweet, um, they're pretty chill and happy with it. And they're saying that the sweet taste is also something that's hardwired, because, um, you know, to survive, you have to find foods that are um, high in energy, and carbohydrate foods are high in energy, and so they've also postulated that with umami, that this is a way you can find high protein foods. And so here is a map of foods. It's kind of hard to see, but these are kind of classic umami packed um, condiments and foods that are popular around the world. So, you know, you don't even need to know the scientific basis behind why umami is important um, because people have naturally known what foods are high in umami um, for generation. So, you know, in the in America, ketchup is king and that's super high in umami because tomatoes are super high in umami. In Southeast Asia, fish sauce, which is probably one of my favorite condiments, um, is super high in umami. Um, you know, aged cheeses, um, and I'll go into all those later. So it's not about, you know, Doritos and hyperpalatable foods. It's actually foods that people have been eating uh, for many, many generations. And so in terms of umami rich foods, seafood is a very big category. Um, and so here are just kind of the top umami packed foods that you should incorporate into your diet. Um, I think prawns, like prawns and shrimp are super popular with people and it's because they're so delicious. And it's because they have umami. And two of the things on this list that I'll go into a little more detail. Oh, and so in terms of fish, the fish that are heavy swimmers actually have higher umami. And what's interesting about that is that Japanese have known that the way that they um, kill the fish actually affects the taste of fish. And so they have a special technique to um, kill the fish after they've been, you know, reeled up that, um, de that is the most humane way because they found that when they're thrashing around, it depletes ATP, and the ATP is actually able to be, be converted into guanylate and inosinate, which are umami compounds. So it's actually important to have humane uh, techniques in terms of um, harvesting your fish and meat. So this here is bonito flakes. This is probably one of the kings of umami. Um, and it's also a perfect example of a food that, um, like, all the, f all the ways to preserve food, because um, you know these are highly perishable foods, also increase umami. So like curing, salting, um, smoking, all of those things that people did to preserve food also naturally make them more delicious, which is actually 
pretty amazing that it all kind of comes together in that way. So Benito Flex, I think there's no less than five different ways that it's processed. I think it's cooked, and it's dried, and it's salted, and it's smoked, and then they flake it really thin. But it's delicious. And anyone who's ever had Japanese food, it's um, used with kombu, that brown algae, to make dashi, which is kind of their mother stock that is in every delicious Japanese food. And then fish sauce, is, as I said before, is my favorite thing in the whole wide world. Um, I do use it in everything. I use it sparingly in everything, but I do kind of use it in everything. But it's another good example of how umami is almost kind of self-limiting, where you can't use too much. Because I don't know if any of you have accidentally poured too much fish sauce in something. It makes it gross. <laughs> and so just a little bit adds enough umami, but you know, too much will make it gross. And so you kind of learn what the limits are. Again, because umami is uh, present in protein-rich foods, obviously it's high in meat products. Um, beef, pork, like bacon is way more umami-rich than you know just a slab of pork because it's been cured and smoked and salted, all things that help break down the protein to release free glutamate. Um, and then poultry, duck is, because it swims more and flies more, it actually has more umami than chicken, egg yolks have higher umami than egg whites. And what's funny is that I'll talk about umami synergy in a little bit, but like naturally, like, like bacon and eggs is like a classic breakfast combination, and it's because they are so delicious together. <laughs> And so here's an example of um, how you pack on the umami with just, a, you know, a duck. So you, ha you get a duck, which is already high in umami. You put on spices, you add some salt, and then just with time and curing it, you have a super delicious dish. But... I don't want you to think that umami is just in meat products. There's actually a lot of umami-rich vegetables. Um, and a perfect example of this is um, probably around 15 years ago, I went to Kyoto with my husband. And this is back when I was like a semi-vegetarian. And I would drag him to go eat um, shojin ryori, which is like classic temple vegetarian food and it's really awesome and beautiful and you have like 12 courses but it's all vegetarian and they have like used all of these ingredients that are super high in umami to make it super delicious I don't know that I was super full but it was super delicious <laughs> um, and so in terms of umami rich vegetables you know seaweed tomatoes are huge um, in terms of being high in umami and they've actually shown that the amount of glutamate increases as it ripens. So if you have a green tomato, it won't be very high in umami, but if you have a super ripe tomato, it'll be higher in glutamate. Um, kimchi, you know, because it's preserved and salted, and, and cabbage itself is high in umami. So once you've preserved it, it's even tastier. Mushrooms are king. I think anybody who says they don't like mushrooms and they don't have an allergy, I don't know that we could be friends. Um, <laughs> But mushrooms, like there's a reason why in Asian cooking, dried mushrooms are used so much more than fresh mushrooms, and it's because it's so much tastier. So like shiitake, fresh shiitake mushrooms are, you know, they have a good amount of um, glutamate. But if you have dried shiitake mushrooms, it's 10 times the amount of glutamate. And then there's also some guanolate that's formed, which is the, the nucleotide. And when they're combined together, you have like, super tasty umami. Um, and so here, truffles are also um, umami bombs. And the, what's really funny is my mom, I think when she first came to America 30 years ago, she was like a bank teller and she wasn't making a ton of money, but she would always go to this um, grocery store in the neighborhood and behind this glass little case, they had all the expensive stuff. And she saw that they were selling these like rock-like things and so she saved her money and she bought one and she was like, oh my God, it was totally disgusting. I was like, well, I'm really sorry, but you, you have to shave it and use it sparingly. Um, but truffles are super expensive because they're super hard to find. They're a fungus um, that are on the root of some plant, but only like specially trained dogs and pigs can find them. Um, 
But the reason why they are so prized is because they really are packed with umami, because they are high in glutamate, they also have inosinate and guanolite. So they have all three compounds that contribute to umami synergy in that one thing. So what is umami synergy? So basically it's combining umami ingredients to generate an amplified and lingering taste sensation. So instead of like one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals eight. And there actually was some sort of scientific study where they came up with this numbering um, system. But basically, if you have, so there's always going to be basal umami, and that is dependent on how much glutamate is in your raw ingredient. But then if you add in nucleotides like inosinate or guanolite, if there are raw ingredients to have that and you cook them together, it is one plus one equals eight, apparently. And Perfect examples of this, I'll have some dishes that show perfect examples of umami synergy. So dashi broth, which again is the mother stock of Japanese cuisine, it combines kombu, which is the brown algae that has tons of glutamate, bonito flakes, which have the nucleotide inosinate, and then shiitake mushrooms, dried shiitake mushrooms, which have glutamate and guanolate. When you put them together, you have this really remarkable broth that really tastes like nothing else. And it's like, how is it possible that you're just combining these different ingredients, but magically, it actually is not magically. There is, if you actually want to go and look up the science, they have, you know, they have like the structure of the glutamate receptor, and then once you add a nucleotide, it becomes this little Pac-Man thing. But I was like, that is too much science for me. I quit my job for a reason. Um, and for Chinese, soup. Like this is a very, very classic soup that my mom used to make all the time and this is what I make all the time. So you have some chicken bones, you, you have some leeks and Napa cabbage and you throw them together and it is delicious. And it's really funny because I was talking to my friend um, and I also put in shiitake mushrooms and she was like, yeah, all of your soups always seem so different from mine. I'm like, really? Because this is what I was brought up with. She's like, yeah, because mine were always just carrots and celery and um, you know, salt and pepper and, you know, some stock, which is good, but this is amazing, and you guys should really try this. And then in terms of, like, classic European dishes, like onions and carrots and celery and beef shanks are like a classic osobuco. And by putting all those things together, it really does taste better, like, than the individual components. So here's another fancy dish, um, but it is demonstrating umami synergy. So there's the tuna, which is a fish that is, you know, high in umami because it's a big swimmer. There's the shiitake mushrooms, and then that is a fancy nori sauce um, made with uh, dried seaweed. And so if you want some simple umami forward dishes, I have a bunch on my website. You don't have to pay for anything. You don't have to buy my book. Um, you can just go to my website, my slow cooker Kahlua pig or my pressure cooker Kahlua pig. All you do is you take a pork shoulder, some salt, you put in some garlic cloves if you want, and then you just put it on, um, you lay three pieces of bacon in your slow cooker, you plop the meat on top, you cook it for like eight to 10 hours, and you will have a delicious pile of pork that you can use in everything. I have a seasoning powder called magic mushroom powder. Um, I use this in place of salt. You, all you do is you get some dried porcini mushrooms or dried shiitake mushrooms. I get mine at Costco. And then you just pulverize that in a spice blender. You combine it with some salt, your favorite dried herbs, and you use that in place of salt, and it makes everything taste better. Um, and this roasted broccoli and bacon is probably my kid's favorite side dish. Um, so I know that if I roast some broccoli with some bacon, my children will eat it. And that is the power of umami synergy. <laughs> <laughs> So here's some quick tips to boost umami. You want to cook low and slow because as you break down um, you know, the protein more, you'll have more free glutamate and it'll taste better. Um, you want to sear protein rich meats and vegetables so that you're also taking advantage of the Maillard reaction. And reheating your leftovers are good. I, I know before I used to 
poo-poo leftovers, but now they are my saving grace. Um, and by actually, you know, reheating leftovers, you are further breaking down the protein <laughs> and you are releasing more glutamate, so you have more umami in your dishes. And that's why stews taste better the next day. So key points are to know which foods are naturally high in umami. Like I always have tomato paste, I always have fish sauce, I always have dried mushrooms as just kind of things in my pantry that I can add really quickly that will make things taste delicious. Um, look to classic combinations. Um, you know, I, I had some examples before from you know Asian food and European dishes, like because those people knew what they were doing and they didn't need a scientist to tell them like this is high in guanolate and this is high in you know glutamate. Restraint and harmony are key, and I think this is something to take away from Japanese cuisine because they are probably the masters of umami. And everything is so delicious and is not like hitting you over the head with like some multicolored, crazy powdered tortilla chip kind of thing. Um, and then a quick cheat is to add fish sauce or my magic mushroom powder. And so resources, if you guys want more information, I have a whole podcast on umami. Um, so you just go into iTunes, the Nom Nom Paleo podcast, episode two. The Umami Information Center is a really, I mean, their whole, I think, being is devoted to spreading the word about umami and they have everything you want to know. And then these two um, books had a lot of science, if you want to delve into the science, and they have some really great uh, recipes as well. And then you can find me online right there, but I'm open to any questions that you guys might have about cooking <laughs> and feeding kids. Sure. Hi, I'm Joy. I love your energy. I still want to be your new best friend. <laughs> Um, I have kind of a question, and if it's too personal, you can tell me to skip it, but you okay. said you were vegetarian. Uh-huh. Did you notice a change? Like, oh, yeah. I was vegetarian, and, and I'm not, and mm -hmm. that's not why I'm fluffy. That's a whole different set of reasons. But I'm happier eating bacon. Do you yes, notice a difference? Yes, like, yes, me? yes, Are all those things. Happier? So I... I, I wasn't a complete vegetarian. I was like a semi-vegetarian. Because I, you know, I was told it was better for me. Right. And so I, I made an attempt to be mostly vegetarian. But I felt terrible. Um, and all I did, I think, was eat whole grains all the time and soy all the time. And my gut was always messed up. My joints hurt. I was tired. I was cranky. I was narcoleptic. And then when I started, I read Rob's book. And I was like, and I thought it was crazy. I remember my husband brought it back, and I was like, this sounds crazy. I don't, I'm going to sabotage you and make whole grain pizza every day. Um, but then I tried it, and I'm like the one third of people who try it and become crazy, who, who reject it initially, and then become crazy evangelists, and that was me. Um, but I felt so much better. Like, all of my GI stuff went away. I had mommy thumb, you know, and that went away. Um, and I just felt better and I, I actually knew when I was full because before I was hungry all the time um, but now I'm much happier my kids are happier with me <laughs> okay. thank you, you're amazing okay. hi. Uh, hi, my name is Magali huge fan um, and I actually own a bone broth company, so I was really intrigued by oh. the different broths you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering about, this is a very practical cooking question, but I'm wondering about the Napa cabbage leek shiitake chicken bone uh -huh. broth. Is that, a, do you just simmer all those together and then remove everything and use it as a broth? Or is that, are you keeping so what, the, the veg in it? So what I do normally is um, I will already have some pre-made bone broth that I've made with bones and whatever else. And then I'll throw the broth with some Napa cabbage, carrots, dried shiitake mushrooms into my pressure cooker. And then I'll set it for like five minutes because that's how long the carrots will take to cook in the pressure cooker. And it is like perfect soup. So it's, just, it's, a, and it's a meatless soup basically, just with the chicken bone broth in it. Yes, it is, but it is not vegetarian. <laughs> The and then I'm going to put in some fish sauce, because that will also amp it up. Or I'll throw in some dried shiitake mushrooms, because you can throw them directly into a pressure cooker without like softening them. Nice. Yeah, so. Awesome. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Leah, and um, I'm a recovered vegetarian. <laughs> there are many of us here. I, I love your book, and the short ribs are amazing. Um, my kids love everything I've made out of your book. So. Thank you. Um, I have sort of a scientific question. I, even I don't I was, know if I can help you with that. <laughs> it's a mommy question, really. Okay. Even when I was a vegetarian, I used a lot of kombu and nori and um, a lot of products from Japan, but mm -hmm. then with Fukushima and the radiation, I, mm. I can't decide the pros versus the cons, the cesium versus the I think Chris Pesek could answer that question. <laughs> well, I know what Chris thinks. <laughs> I do know what Chris thinks. I was wondering what, you what think. do What do I do? Yeah. All right. So, do you worry about it? Do you not? Um, I do and I don't. Because I think if I stress out about all these little minutia things, like I'll go crazy. Um, and you can try to be way too perfect. And that's not very, um, you know, that's just not a good way to live when you're so stressed about things. Like I like the, um, like my kids really like the seaweed snacks. What is that brand I like? Sea snacks. Mm -hmm. And so they actually have this whole thing about how it's, the wrong current from Fukushima or something. I don't know. And so I feel better when I give them that. But I also think it's also better than them eating some crazy junk food, right? right. I mean, so I think there's pluses and minuses. And I think one time I was talking to my friend who worked for a failure analysis company. I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm really worried about this, this, and this. And he was like, you know what? You are way more likely to get hit by a car than any of these other things right. <laughs> killing you. Right. And so I was like, okay, well, that's a really good perspective. So I think you just try to do the best you can, and that that is enough, right? Like, as long as you are actually trying to do better, right. and you're not making excuses and saying, oh, I can't do that, so I'm just going to get them, you know, a happy meal. But if you're really trying, I think that's good enough. Great. Thank you. No problem. One last question. Oh, okay. One last question. Sorry. Is that okay? No, thanks. Okay. I think I already told you how much I'm such a big fan. I really thank you for your cookbook and your energy. And um, I have definitely done the best I can at my household with my one daughter and my husband. We all feel so much better after a year and a half. And you've made cooking so much fun. Well, thank you. I wanted to know. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to know if you had any plans for making a kids a cookbook directed for meals just for kids. Please, no. Please, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's funny is our first cookbook, even though it's not made for kids, we kind of that was kind of our I'll, like our secret agenda was to make it appeal to kids because it's like this bright red book. It has cartoons in it. There are step-by-step -step pictures. There are like butt jokes and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and so we were hoping that this is something that people, that parents could just put on their um, coffee table and then the kids would be drawn to it and they'd just look through it and then they would be like, hey, Bobby, how about we make this? Or these kids look like they like this too. So I think we try to make our books secretly appeal to kids. But we're not, um, we, we are working on a second book, <laughs> but it's not, it's not um, specifically tailored for kids. Because I think our whole thing is we try not to dumb it down to have like separate meals for kids. No. Because I did that for a long time and it sucked. Um, and so I, like, I think one day I was like, why is it that my mom never made a separate meal for us and we ate it? And then secondly, why will I not eat my kids' leftovers, you know? And so I think our goal was to make foods that everybody liked. And we kind of compromised so I don't make it super spicy or anything. But I think your kids probably have more adventurous palates than you give them credit for. Um, and so, yeah, I think one meal for all. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Thank you. Thank you.